Good afternoon. So we're here today for uh, our roundtable discussion focusing on soft power and the role of art in that uh, equation. I'm Damian Wetzel. I'm the director of the Aspen Institute Arts Program. Uh, wonderful to have you all with us and welcome to the live stream audience as well. Uh, we're going to kick this off today uh, with a special guest we have, Ambassador Gordon Giffen, uh, the 19th Ambassador to Canada from the United States, uh, under whose ambassadorship uh, a work of art was placed uh, at the embassy by the great Joel Shapiro, who's our guest of honor today. So I want to welcome Ambassador Giffen and uh, Joel Shapiro. And uh, Ambassador, if you could kick us off, you know, the, the overall topic today is the role of art in diplomacy. Diplomacy, uh, and we'll get into various aspects of it, and we'll uh, have a discussion, which hopefully will include many of you. Uh, but uh, if you could tell us about your experience uh, with uh, with Joel and what it meant to you as a diplomat, and uh, give us some background. Thank you, Damien. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm only special, and Joel's great. I, I have to keep following him around in uh, that context. Um, it's a delight to be here, and I'm, I'm thrilled that all of you are here today. Thank you for coming, and, and uh, of course, I want to acknowledge the presence of the president of FAPE, Eden Rapshun, who um, I didn't get the chance to work with uh, at FAPE when we were doing our work in Ottawa, but uh, have enormous respect for the work they're doing still today. Uh, a quick sense of, um, from my perspective, the role of art in diplomacy. When I was appointed the 19th U.S. Ambassador to Canada, I have to say I had no earthly idea what or if art had any role in diplomacy. I thought my job was to be a, an advocate for U.S. government policies, and that's what I was sent to Ottawa to do. Um, if you're going to be good at your job, however, Early on, the light goes on and you realize that a large part of what you need to be doing uh, is not just advocating U.S. policies, but communicating U.S. values, what our citizens' values are when they get up every day. And a primary way that you can do that is through um, demonstrating U.S. culture. And, of course, a big component of U.S. culture is U.S. art. Now, in Canada, people believe they know everything about the U.S., everything about the U.S. culture. One reason is they happen to live right next door to us. The other is they are overwhelmed by our television, which one could debate whether that's a good expression of what <laughs> U.S. culture is. Um, so. When I arrived in Ottawa, I started to realize the various dimensions of how we express as a people and as a government who we are and what represents us. Uh, the building I occupied when I first got there was the original U.S. Embassy in Ottawa, directly across from their parliament buildings, a gorgeous old uh, edifice that, that was a wonderful piece of architecture in downtown Ottawa, but it had gotten old, too small. We'd grown dramatically as a U.S. presence there and needed to be replaced. And um, I oversaw the construction of a new U.S. Embassy in Ottawa at that time, in the late 90s, the only U.S. Embassy under construction. Um, and, and I realized that as a writ large, the embassy building itself is a piece of art. And we were lucky that we had an extraordinary architect at the time, a guy by the name of David Childs, who was, is with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. David, among other th things, chaired the Pennsylvania Avenue Redevelopment Commission in Washington for um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan and did a remarkable job of, of visualizing a redeveloped Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, David Childs created what I thought was an, a remarkable art, piece of artistic work uh, in the building itself. Now, we had to convince a lot of people in Ottawa that it was actually a piece of art, but li little, little by little we were able to. Um, inside our facilities, the um, um, Art and Embassies program at the State Department does a remarkable job as well. Uh, they 
assisted and permitted my wife Patty in uh, traveling throughout the American South, borrowing pieces of art from galleries and private collectors in the South. And in our embassy residence, we displayed, uh, I think, a, a remarkable um, array of Southern artists. Uh, and in, in Canada, they didn't know there was such a thing as Southern art. Um, so it, it uh, was able to help people realize that there is part of the United States south of New York and Michigan and Ohio. Um, so that interior manifestation of art was something that, frankly, our guests to our residents would wander around the residence looking at each piece of art and ask, where did this come from? It came from North Carolina or Georgia or South Carolina, Tennessee. And then uh, Judy Ney came to me. Judy Ney, uh, wife at the time of Ed Ney, who had been one of my predecessors as U.S. Ambassador to Canada, was very, very involved with the Friends of Art and Preservation and Embassies at that time. And she said, Gordon, we have an opportunity for FAPE to commission the first specifically commissioned piece of exterior art, a sculpture, for this brand new embassy. And I said, okay, don't know what that means. Um, and, 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 and she, she said, well, let me spend some time talking to you about it. And she brought several other representatives of FAPE to the embassy. And, and it became clear to me that there, there was a courtyard in the design of this new embassy. And it became clear to me this, this was a fabulous opportunity to make a statement in our new embassy is right downtown Ottawa between their historic Byward Market and the Parliament buildings. Not as perfect a location as the Canadian Embassy has in Washington today, but, but similar uh, in many respects. It's right across the street from their National Gallery, and of course the Canadians is right across the street from our National Gallery. They're in sight of our capital. We're in sight of their Parliament building. So the, the location of this piece of sculpture, this piece of public art, would be very central to the city, whether they liked it or not, because uh, it was our ground. Um, and so Judy said, we have the opportunity to have one of the more renowned American artists, a, sculpture by the, a sculptor by the name of Joel Shapiro, create a specially commissioned piece of work for this embassy. And I said, that's really terrific. Who is Joel Shapiro? Uh, it was demonstrating my um, lack of knowledge of art, not Joel's lack of prominence. Uh, and and um, so I learned more about um, Joel's work. And I have to say, before I started this, I was a landscape guy. When I look at art, I need to recognize a tree and a river and an old barn. And they showed me some of Joel's work, and I said, hmm, that's awfully creative. I need to understand this more. And I did a lot of reading, and I consulted a lot of people, and more and more I became convinced that having a Joel Shapiro commissioned piece in our courtyard would be a remarkable statement for our country in our closest neighbor and ally in Canada. So I, I became uh, overwhelmingly positive about the opportunity to have that kind of statement uh, in the public square, if you will, in, in Ottawa as a demonstration of our interest in communicating art and our values to our Canadian friends. Got to know Joel well, worked with him a lot. I have to say it's the only piece of art I've ever participated in installing that required a hard hat and a crane. Uh, and and uh, the last thing I will say before turning it over to Joel is, I don't know how many times this has happened, but the First Lady of the United States of America and then candidate for the U.S. Senate in New York, Hillary Rodham Clinton, came to Ottawa solely for the purpose of dedicating uh, Joel's piece of art in the um, in the courtyard, and I, I think if Joel's showing slides, he'll probably show you a slide of our our um, our ceremony where it was dedicated. I keep telling 
my family, oh, look at the picture of me, and everybody says, no, that's of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> so y you'll see Hillary, you probably won't notice me. But it was a very special day that the First Lady of the United States would come to one of our embassies and uh, dedicate that piece of art. Two weeks later, her husband actually came and dedicated the U new U.S. Embassy, and it's the only U.S. Embassy in our history dedicated by a sitting president. So we had a very special experience in Ottawa. So I, I recommend that you go and visit Ottawa. It's not that far to see Joel's great piece of work, and our also and also our our uh, our embassy, which I also think is a piece of public art. Thanks so much, Ambassador Giffen, for that uh, candid kind of look at how, how it actually can happen and how it does happen. And I, I should say that when we talk about FAPE, I know many of you here are uh, familiar with FAPE, but the Foundation for Art and Preservation and Embassies is the group that uh, created the opportunity for, for Joel and many other artists to do good work, as it were, to do citizen work uh, in giving their art uh, to embassies and consulates around the world. Uh, and Eden Refshun, as president, is sitting right here. And we'll, uh, we'll discuss more about uh, FAPE uh, as we go on. But first, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, the great man himself, Joel Shapiro. And Joel, if you would just, uh, let's turn to the art for a minute and talk about, you know, uh, and you could show us a few things and give us some background on where you came into this equation. Thank you for all being here. Uh, Ottawa is very cold, but it's a wonderful city. <laughs> First of all, yeah. And that sculpture had to endure frigid temperature and cyclonic wind. Uh, <clears throat> I'll show you, I, you know, I brought very few slides, and that's a slide of my studio, just so you know that artists work in a certain degree of chaos and uh, changing and shifting interiors. And eventually you come up with a form or it's sometimes a form that goes into a specific space. I go to the right. Okay, this is an installation I, this is, this is my most recent work or the most recent installation at an institution. And it's a series of sus suspended blocks, suspended beams that are, they're actually hollow, that are painted and you, this is at Rice University. You walk into the SIP space and kind of move around the sculpture. The sculpture alters and shifts, so. And I'm not gonna give you a, a big lecture on my work, because it. This is a photograph of the sculpture in Ottawa. This is an extremely challenging commission. Uh, it's always difficult, but in a certain way, the art ends up mediating the architecture or functions as some mid-level between people walking around and seeing the architecture. And I think particularly now in our current climate where uh, embassies and consulates have to be well protected, that there's a real opportunity for the art to have a kind of liveliness, liveliness and vitality and access, you look at it, you can understand it. You do not have to touch work or even walk around it all the time. So this, if, I think there's another photograph. This is a photograph, this is, this is, a, a, this is actually a photograph after the famous Steichen photograph of, Rose, of Rodin's Balzac. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, and this was, taken by the director of the Muse d'Orsay in Paris, who's really a... Anyway, the sculpture is this sort of a st stairway from a lower part of Ottawa to a higher ground in Ottawa, and you walk up the stairway and you kind of experience the sculpture. So in a certain way, the sculpture was very much in public space, not <laughs> confined within the not confined by the gate of the embassy. Uh, this is a photograph of a piece I recently, which was recently commissioned by FAPE in Guangzhou, China. Uh, it's a, this is a large, this is not an embassy, it's a consulate. It's extremely large. It occupies 
I don't know how many acres, but it's quite enormous in downtown Guangzhou, surrounded by massive skyscrapers. Uh, and so the buildings are, I, I stayed on the 91st floor of a hotel, <laughs> which I've never stayed on the 91st floor of a hotel anywhere else. Anyway, and everyone can look into the embassy. So, of course, you can't take photographs, but anybody could, so it's beyond that. Uh, this, is, this is actually a photograph that looks like a rendering. That looks like a rendering, right? So anyway. It does. Are those real people? Yeah, yeah those are actually real people. And this is, lo this, is looking, this is looking from outside the consulate with a little bit of cheating. So the, there is a fence that you would have to look through. So it's, the piece is actually very exposed and very open to the public. Uh, I think the architects made a tremendous effort in both cases to develop a campus that was both protected and accessible so it didn't feel like a fortress. Uh, and I think it's a real architectural challenge and to do that. Uh, something artists really don't have to deal with, but architects have to deal with. Uh, these are some photographs of some outreach that the State Department set up. They, somebody, FAPE asked me if I was willing to give a talk, and I said, sure. And then I think I was talking from 9 until 9 at night, <laughs> marched around the city and visiting kind of a, th this fellow in the center who's a very revered Chinese sculptor, did early portraits of Mao, was very involved in the revolution, and uh, was, I mean, he was just, it was an interesting journey. And each one is followed by a grand banquet. Uh, this is me talking at the Guangzhou Academy of Art, which actually specialized in sculpture. There are 300,000 students on this island in the Pearl River. Uh, and the, the kids were great. I mean, it was really exciting. I mean, you'd go into their studios, and they were totally hip, doing work more or less like kids would be doing at Yale or anywhere else. I mean, there's such an international discourse at this point with the internet. I think those are art students and me. And that's the consul general and the audience, the architect. And I don't know what this is. Oh, this is the, Guan, the Guangdong Time Museum. And that's a kind of radical museum where they show very avant-garde work. And they exist and they're functioned. Everyone knows about it. <clears throat> but I think they have to keep their mouths <coughs> slightly shut. But it was interesting. It's a big turnout. That's a view of the city. OK, enough. No, I, I didn't. I, I, I didn't. It's in your, it's in your pamphlet. It is? I should have. Oh, you're right. I don't have it. I read your stuff. I mean, my problem is, my problem is I'm, I'm busy working. It's difficult. You know, I want to pick up, Joel, on something you said about art being a mediator. I think that's an essential, essential question that I'm sure Ambassador, you know, Giffen was well aware of when he was confronted with the idea of something that stands between the embassy and the public. Uh, and the idea of where, where the art fits into that is central to uh, the ideas of what your art actually is, an audience, and how you think about it from an abstract point of view or a literal point of view. Are you trying to, w when you mediate, you are saying something, you're in between, you're, you're expressing something. So can you talk a little bit about you know, the, 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 the obligation of a commission like this in that, in that sense? as an abstract, as an abstraction, or as a literal uh, piece of art? Well, I mean, I think at first, you know, you look at the site and look at, mo and, and look at models of the site and build models of the site. I mean, I'm kind of not interested in objects, so I don't want the piece to just refer to something. I want it to actively engage in its community, whether that would be you know, the campus and uh, 
you know, the staircase in Ottawa and the flower district and the parks above. So, I mean, there's some formal concerns. And then I think within that situation, I think you have to do some form that's, inci that's exciting and engaging. And I think really, you know, nobody's ever imposed a narrative on my work. They've never said, oh, do an eagle, do this, do that. I mean, do so. And, <coughs> and I would not enter into that kind of commission. I mean, even in Washington at the Holocaust Museum, I mean, there was no real directives. You know, you sort of have to sort of figure out what would be, you know, what engages you as an artist individually, and you assume that you've worked for 45 years or 35 years, and, you know, I don't know, great, good, I know. I know, you know, great's something we figure out much later. <laughs> we don't worry about that. Uh, and I think what would engage me could then quite possibly engage others. But in order to instill that sense of life and vitality into the form, I think is the critical issue. And how, and can that be read? And can that sort of transcend culture? I think it can. So, so life and vitality was the message that you wanted to make sure was present. And is it is that a common thread you feel in all of your work, or is this no, something I that think you're some saying for well, an more, I, I would say that I'm at this point I'm much more interested in vitality than you know something that's that's morose. But I believe me, there's a lot of profound art that's about the morose. I mean, can, can, I, dis can I add ah. something from the <laughs> yeah. Can I add something from the perspective of the the job of the diplomat in thinking about the art, y'all are going to have to, I probably won't be able to get you to visualize this, but Joel's uh, talking about a staircase that's awfully important in the context of what I think the piece of art does. In Ottawa, our embassy w was occupying a space that was unoccupied in Ottawa, and there's a historic district, the Byward Market, that's old architecture, stone architecture, and as you go up a hill, you, you start to approach their relatively new National Gallery, which is a spectacular building, and it's a very modern piece of architecture. So in Ottawa, you have historic architecture, 17th or 18th century architecture, I guess, Colin, or maybe, maybe before that, transitioning to beautiful glass and steel architecture. And we designed in connection with our embassy a grand staircase, in effect, that we paid for and built. It's outside the property of the embassy, but it goes right next to the embassy that actually connects the lower part of the city to this upper part and permitted a flow of people. And it took me a while to get this, but Joel's piece of art is a transition on the way from that part of town to, to the upper part of town, which is Ottawa. That was Ottawa's doing. We didn't do that. But, and, and your sculpture is called Conjunction, and I always feel like, yeah, I mean, I don't know what was intended by the name, but I, I, I think of it as joining parts of Ottawa that were already there, which I find to be a remarkably generous effort by uh, us as diplomats that your piece of art uh, achieved in connection with that staircase. No, I, that's I, as profound as I can get about it. That's, that's <laughs> good. No, it, it, uh, let's say it works. Uh, also, I think, you, isn't Parliament there? Or, yeah, yeah, Parliament's I mean, This beyond. is sort of the most serious court or green, green space in Ottawa. And below it, below the stairs, is public, famous market, and lots of people go in and out. And uh, I had a. Tr did it did it change what you wanted to do, knowing that that conjunction, of of uh, that nexus was where it was going to be? In oh, your mind, just well, I mean, I think. It it well, I mean, I, I made the piece. You know, I wanted the piece to be. There's a real problem. Like how I'm not. I, I'm interested in sculpture that's fairly transparent. What I mean, I don't want sculpture that blocks buildings and blocks your point of view. So I, I mean, I, you know, and you don't want to stick something that blocks the sight of uh, Parliament, uh, you know, the Canadian Parliament. So I think it's really a delicate matter, you know, 
how you introduce a form <clears throat> into another, uh, well, really into another culture. And, and I mean, face it, I mean, architecture is culture. Streets are culture. That's all a manifestation of how <clears throat> the civ how the civil how we function. Uh, and uh, you have to be thoughtful about it. I mean, you can't just do the most aggressive thought in your mind, which one might do in some other situation. Right, to make <clears throat> a statement uh, of, a, of a different sort. I mean, I think of this as a, so let, let's turn to China for a second. So the opportunity to put your sculpture at, at that consulate in Guangzhou, which has the hundreds and hundreds of people lining up for visas every day to come to the United States, and it's the thing that stands out, and it's surrounded in this atmosphere of the buildings with the 91st floor hotel rooms and looking down on it. That's a, it's an opportunity to say many things. I love the idea what you said about in, in Ottawa, it had to endure. It's, gonna, it's an endurance statement, and as, <laughs> as, a, as a dancer, I look at it and I think it's a dancer, and it's standing there well, in the Well, that's very, that's very, that's very dance. It is, influence. no? Well, I mean, that piece is, you know. Yeah. The, the, the one in China, less so, perhaps. Less so. Uh, but that m idea of audience and messaging and the, the challenge of that, can you talk a little bit well, about that? Well, I think that? you think about it. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, I just think you take all these things into context when you're working. And, you know, if you're a sophisticated artist, you're aware of the audience, you're aware of the context, you're definitely aware of your own history. And the only thing that's really engaging in, as an artist is to push your work further in some new direction or explore certain situations. So I don't, I mean, I, I think the idea is not to be overwhelmed by a commission of such magnitude, but to stay on track in your pursuit of work. I sound like I'm talking to art students, so I apologize. Uh, but, but, you know, do it, can, you know, absorb the context. And I thought, you know, I looked very carefully at the architecture in Guangzhou, and it wa the architecture wasn't that large, and I began to make a piece of a certain size. I had other proposals, but they didn't work. I mean, I had, uh, but this was the one that was like this <coughs> very spontaneous, almost, I shouldn't say combustible, form. And it really sat there and worked. I think what was remarkable, which may have been great, and it's also the color is very intense. It's painted a kind of very intense blue in it. So it's a massive shape that's very blue in a city that's mostly natural material and an incredible amount of projected light. I mean, at night, Guangzhou, I mean, it looks like a pinball machine or something. I mean, it's like... There's so much neon and so much this and that. And this has some real solidity. Uh, I think it was very well received. What your gen by, by one's anxiety as an artist said, number one, you hope the State Department and the staff kind of like the work. I mean, I, kn I know situations where an ambassador was, you know, quite upset by a sculpture or, or a, a paint a sculpture by a friend of mine, and uh, which was a very good work, but he was a kind of conservative fellow. Uh, it takes a leap of faith. I mean, you know, buildings are practical. People go into the consulate to get visas. People go there apparently to adopt children. So this, I know many, many people who stayed at the White Swan Hotel in Guangzhou, uh, which is the old, where, which is where the old American embassy was. Uh, so there's a, a massive amount of traffic, and you know you really have some larger obligation to do something that's engaging. But I don't, you know, I myself am not interested in narrative. I mean, I'm not interested in some simple storytelling. Other artists might like that. I don't. Did so you feel? Um, do you ever any uh, any feeling of patriotism as you did these things? Yeah, sure. I mean, like you're. I'm yeah, I was delighted and proud to be asked. And, uh, and, and in terms of the, the use factor, you talked about, you know, to me, you know, that, that, that argument between architecture as an art or as a place where things happen, and this is somewhere in the middle here. I well, mean. people will accept dismal architecture. <laughs> because mean, of the plumbing. <laughs> yeah, because of the plumbing, exactly. And, the, and, the, and they're much tougher on art. 
I mean, I think, you know, I remember the big controversy in New York with Richard Serra's Tilted Arch. I was about to ask that. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I think it was naturalization department, really tough, you know, a tough, tough, brutal building, and it was a tough, brutal sculpture, but nobody wanted to tear the building down. But they wanted to get rid of Richard's piece because it was, people saw it. People saw the piece as a metaphor of their situation. And I think, you know, the public reads art as a metaphor of their situation. People see, you know, the Vietnam Memorial as some, me I mean, it conjures up all this emotion of their experience of that time. Uh, this is what art does. Uh, it can be, people can be very reactive to it. On the other hand, there's all kinds of miserable architecture that we endure and suffer through. Yeah, it really is the distinctive quality of art that it, it engages us in another way, whether we understand it or not, if there is an understanding possible. Right, uh, and its its use is, you know, I don't, I, it's, it's, I don't, it, it does, it's not as utilitarian, that's all. I mean, it's just not part of, you know, I think it's an, I think it's a necessity and it's a manifestation of human condition, but, you know, you could also live without looking at a painting. Right. Which is not the case. You cannot live without a wall or a tent or something. Cover. Yes. Cover. Shelter. 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 Right. Yeah. Okay. So again, though, these things are overlapping in this sense because this is, uh, these are government spaces. These are the spaces that represent America in the world to, to a degree, to whatever, you know, people are, have access to them, whether it's to go there for a visa or just walking by and looking through a fence at this point. Uh, and so they are serving a utilitarian purpose on that level that it reminds me, and we spoke a little bit earlier about this, of other diplomatic efforts over the years, and we've, uh, others in this room have talked about this, efforts by uh, covert and overt, let's say, by the CIA in the Cold War, to bring art as a, as a message of America. This is who we are as Americans, and some of it was understood by the artists involved. Some of it, uh, in later years, revelations are they had no idea. Uh, and yet it was calculated to express, frankly, the, the, the sense of, quote unquote, freedom in America, and uh, to some extent, um, the ideals, the values. And so I wanted to ask you about where you, you felt this current day efforts fit into that, uh, in terms of uh, the programs that you've been involved with, with FAPE uh, and art and embassies. Uh, and then also just simply uh, the idea of value of art throughout the ages, the idea of that, what you just started touching on, that it has that unique quality and how that plays into uh, use. Well, I, you know, I really do think it's remarkable that FAPE, I did check out FAPE and made sure there were no CIA connections. <laughs> no, uh, you know, FAPE it's, is it's hard to be. It's hard to be covert with your work. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, well, it's an unintended <laughs> consequence could be the covert part. Uh, yeah. But no, I do think, I mean, I, do, I do, do think what FAPE does is to put, you know, I mean, there's a greater opportunity for m more radical, imaginative thinking in painting and sculpture to put things like that at the embassy. It's really a celebration of, uh, you know, of a, of a certain degree of, of the degree of freedom that we experience. You know, that it's not controlled. You know, the State Department said, no, you can't do that. Or the government said, you can't do that. I mean, they're allowing this work to exist and be representative of a certain quality of, of culture in the country. And I think it's totally important. And I think, yeah, I'm proud of That's something I really am proud of and so pleased to be part of. Interesting. And then, uh, Ambassador Given, maybe you could comment on, you know, the actuality of it. So then the thing is there. It's beautiful. It's arrived. Hillary Clinton, the uh, First Lady, uh, Senator-to-be, uh, has come to dedicate it, and the President comes two weeks later. Uh, and there is this sense of the power of art which you cannot control. It is now there, and people are taking what they will from it. You can't actually dictate what they're going to take away from it. Uh, did you, is that a letting go? Uh, of control in a, in a very controlled space? Well, certainly because it's in public, but it, 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 you have to realize we were having a big conversation in Ottawa because we had just built a new building, and to Joel's point, it, it, you know, people talk a lot about the building, and, and frankly, not many people in Ottawa like the building. So there was an awful lot of conversation about the building, and 
and and that was disappointing in a, in a way to me because our, our building there, again, the transition that I talked about, one side of our building there is stone that reflects the stone of the Byward market. One side of our building is glass that reflects the glass uh, of, of their uh, national gallery. A lot of creative thought was given to this building as a piece of art that would harmonize with its environment, and not many people in Ottawa liked it uh, at the time. And, and I even, I held a press conference, this was before your piece was installed, and I read an article to the press that talked about this huge piece of concrete in the middle of the Grand Boulevard in the Capitol across from the National Gallery with windows that appeared like gun slits. And they're all thinking I'm reading an article about the new U.S. Embassy. It was a 1989 uh, article in the Washington Post describing the Canadian Embassy in Washington. <laughs> and, and when I passed that, uh, that, that copy, they're all, their jaws dropped. Because now we look at that as a wonderful piece of architecture and art in our capital city. And I said, give this time, folks. You know, I mean, you'll get used to it. So, you, you, and to, to, to Joel's piece, I remember saying, he won't remember this, I remember saying to him at one point, you know, Joel, I'm sort of into can't help it. I'm sort of into realism. I like to look at something and know what it is. And he looks at me and he says, oh, you're the guy that wants the general sitting on a horse. <laughs> no, I remember that. I remember that dedication. Peter Jennings' sister was there. Yes. And she liked the sculpture. So I said, oh, well, that somehow I had this idea that she was this huge tastemaker in Ottawa. Well, she had an impact on people's yeah. view of, of, of culture and art in but Ottawa. I, I think the, it the, 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 But you, you, on many occasions, made a very good point to me, and I thought, well, no, I don't really want that at all. And boy, would that have been a mistake in that place, you know, to, it, to have something, even an eagle sitting there. It would have been too much, you know... Uh, yeah. Presentation of the American I think this has some power. Bird, this has some bird reference. Yes, Guangzhou. There is there is a certain bird-like quality. It's but true. To, but to your um, to, to your <laughs> to your question, once you put a large Blue building birds. and a large sculpture out there in someone's it's else's capital it's city in their public space, you, you, it, it it either works or it doesn't. And and I think over time, all of it has harmonized. Frankly, I think in Ottawa now, what they don't like is the fact that we've closed lanes on either side of the building. It's not now the uh, the art or the building. It's the fact that we're impeding traffic. I think you know, Joel. Maybe we could talk a little bit now about you know the the differences between abstraction and let's say a literal a literal work of art in that context. Which you know, to me. Uh, it, you, your work strikes a blow for abstraction. It makes us think. It makes anybody who walks by it think. There's something about it that's enlivening, and the vitality you're, you talk about as being the essential element uh, comes to the fore. Uh, and I would love to just you know talk about form and abstraction just for a minute. When you when you approached that project, uh, let's say Guangzhou because it's most recent. That's a difficult. I, I mean, that's a hard. You asked for a tough one. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the way I make something like this is I put stuff together, and you know, not on. I mean, with a greater degree of sophistication, and knowledge. But what you try to do is come up with some fresh, imaginative form that has some visual meaning, more than visual meaning. That has some deeper meaning. Uh, so you're sort of creating your own world. And, you know, my work, you always know what it is. I mean, you know, everyone's played with blocks. Everybody's played with, I'm, I'm not embarrassed by this, you know, with joining pieces of wood together. I mean, I don't think that, so you, it's not, the reason I bring that up is because the other thing, I, I, I have a real problem with colossal work. Okay. And, I, and so I've always avoided the colossal in my work. So I mean, <clears throat> somehow you're, the parts so you, the parts are familiar. The parts are something of one's life. So to a certain extent, that's a kind of realism. Maybe that's more real than representation. So you know, you, and I think artists of my generation were really interested in. 
that the work would stand on its own in terms of one's experience in the world versus a kind of synthetic representation and um, uh, uh, obligation of reference. Well, yeah, I'm an obligation. Or yes, I think that would be fair enough. I mean, so, so I mean, we could talk about work in Washington. I, I'm not going to because I'm not. I haven't. I don't live. <laughs> You're here. in Washington. I'm yes. in Washington. <laughs> you know, it's General Sherman, the St. Gaudens in Central Park. You know, in front of Central Park, is a wonderful sculpture. I mean, it's great. And it's of its time, and it's so good that it transcends its time. But that would be a preposterous idea now to have, you know, even, you know, General, so, so General that, Patton coming into Berlin. I don't even look up much of you know, on a t on a jeep would make absolutely no sense. <laughs> and I also think I think there was a massive change in the 20th century, where in the 19th century most art was prescribed. I mean, it was either religious, it was narrative. Almost all public public sculpture was, was a commemorative, right? Or commemorative things. We still have commemorative works. I mean, I've done them, other people have done them. But for the most part, you know, at an embassy, nobody's going to say, well, do a commemorative work in the memory of of what? I mean, of uh, the opium wars in China? I mean, what would it be of? So I mean, what you want to do is so much in the present tense that's active. Well, that's why I titled the piece now. But it's, that's really about about currency, about the current. Right, and speaks to the the principle of vitality. I mean, when I've, I've read you, you know, use the word ancient values that instill, you know, I don't know, good work, great work. How how we describe it? That you know, let's say. Uh, the statue you described in Central Park, which would be perhaps absurd to have created today, but it fits in this continuum. And you are, you know, in your continuum. Um, and the idea of the blocks, I want to go back to that for one minute, mm -hmm. because what I get in so many different ways when I, I look at uh, these two works is the idea of possibility. And I think that is an underlying message that certainly uh, I think the diplomatic community would embrace, the idea of the United States as being a place of possibility. Um, and I take that one step further, and uh, we spoke earlier a little bit about Lincoln Kirstein, and I, uh, he, is, he had written, and it's a, it's a not, he's not the first to say it, but you know, there's been one creation, and after that there was invention. And you take blocks, and you show inventiveness that can be done, and it's something that, let's say you're standing in a visa line, it must occur to you in some way intrinsically, whether you literalize it or not, like I want to go and make something, but there's something about making something in that. Do you, do you find any, uh, any thoughts about that in terms of how you work? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean no, artist w no artist invents a form. I mean, the forms are there, they're in the world. It's the kind of combination of the elements that become unique, personal, and kind of expressive so I mean you're not going to whether I mean you're not you don't invent a horse and a rider no less you invent a bunch of sticks no I mean, but they're there and I think it's that recombination and that putting together a form in a specific way that really is new and or has a possibility to communicate but I think that's in itself about, and not be about sentimental. a history and not be sentimental to be the, the sentiment yeah it's it's tough I mean, the standards, the FAPE standards are extremely high. They're asking really difficult artists to do, when I say difficult, artists that are challenging, you know, not easy artists, so to do, to do, to really think and act in this public arena and communicate their own thinking and thought. And it's not about, you know, telling them to do, you know, do something that we know will be a crowd pleaser. Uh, which you would get in many private commissions. I can honestly say hmm. as an ambassador that was from the southern United States that if anyone had proposed doing a statue of General Sherman, I wouldn't have accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. He was a, he was a pretty brutal guy. <laughs> it's, uh, it, that's a very controversial sculpture, by the way. I mean, the, the narrative is controversial, not the form. But it's realize safe. also, I mean, F FAPE is a, a dynamic instrument in this because, but for, I mean, FAPE certainly was the catalyst that brought about our getting to know each other. 
but they were also um, a, a, an educational tool for me because in the final analysis, like it or not, the ambassador at the time gets to decide whether or not this happens. Right. And, and, and so FAPE performed not only the role of involving you and in commissioning the piece, but of educating me to the point where I realized that it could be a significant contribution to our presence in Ottawa. And if I had stayed wedded to a general on a horse, there would have been a general on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, you were teasing. I was teasing you when I said that. Did you uh, find that? Uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine that, Joel, you do a lot of negotiating about what your work's going to be. No, I mean, I, I, I will listen. No, I listen to the client, to the people who are commissioning it very carefully. And I also listen to the architect extremely carefully because I really think, you know, it's their space. They're more familiar with the space than I am. So I'm really interested in, you know, what David Childs and Craig Hartman had to say, particularly in terms of scale and what's going to work. You know, I mean, scale is a critical issue. You don't want to overwhelm the site, and you don't want to underwhelm the site. I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, I learned early on, if the sculpture's too small, it doesn't work. And you also don't want to block the entire site. So there's some kind of balance where the work communicates and, you know, a certain size where it expresses its intent. And as I said, you know, the two things I really don't like are the colossal and something that's solid and blocks what you can see in the world, where the sculpture becomes the only thing. Did you have any ground rules going in, in your, in your own mind, like the first time you were approached to do a project like this, where you just opened it? I, I, yeah, I, well, you know, you sort of, somebody asks you to do something, and you say, well, I'll do it. They can always reject it down the line. No, I, there were no ground rules. I, actually, in Guangzhou, the building changed a little bit it changed quite a bit, didn't it? <laughs> the, the height of the building, Jen? Yeah. Oh, there we are. I didn't see it. Uh, but, I mean, I was informed about everything. There was no, uh, no, no, no ground rules. I do think, you know, at one point, one of these elements was pointing to the opera house, and that was considered rude. So we, with the Zaha Adi's opera house, so we rotated the piece, so it was pointing at the Chinese IRS, and everyone, th everyone thought that was great. You know, this, this is a great thing. <laughs> See, I love the idea of that. That is a conversation that is ongoing. Then it's about the nature of the work itself, and then it's about even the angles that it, which it. Oh, I think you have to you have to recognize local yeah. customs. I was very careful about the color and you know the number of elements and. <clears throat> That's not you know. There's there's certainly. You make it sound completely uh, as a matter of course for you, but I think, uh, you know, I know a number of artists who would say, no, it has to be. There's that has to be sense. But I think that it's wonderful to think of this as what you said. It's a mediator. It's a conversation between your work and the, and the building and the community and, and the audience, which uh, has the, the desired effect, I guess, in the end. It's because it, it's, no, it's alive then. I, but I think FAPE, uh, FAPE, the architect, and the State Department were all extremely cooperative, and everybody wanted to see this done, and, and they wanted to see it done basically on my terms as long as they didn't violate any kind of important interest, you know? I mean, we had to move the piece a bit, this and that, but, I mean, there was no, I think it was, in, incredibly successful. In a way, it's almost easier than working in your studio, where you have all the responsibility. It's nice to have a partner. I see that, <laughs> and you have a, some. A partner who's not involved creatively, but sort of allowing you to realize these things. I don't think, you know, artists get to make sculpture, you know, that's 22 foot tall, a large piece like that, without patronage. It just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I. My last question really is how do you feel about being, you know, personally as an artist, uh, essentially, in, you know, having your work be an instrument of, of soft power, which, you know, the concept which Joe and I, uh, you know, enunciated really about, you know, the messaging of the United States or, or of any country's culture and what, what they represent uh, out to the world. Well, I mean, I think realistically, and I've always felt that if you take any artwork from any culture, 
it is a manifestation of a period of time, right? So, you know, you could take, uh, 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 I guess it's Hiram Power, the American sculptor who did George Washington, wonderful George Washington. But I mean, if you look at that carefully and look at the form and look at this, you know, it's meaningful and it's meaningful and it reflects on that period of time. So art can be an exhilarating spiritual moment. It's also an artifact. So it always reflects culture. Always. Always. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's any good, I think. I mean, I think it is, you know, it's, a, it's something that's produced in a period of time, and it has all this meaning to it. All these tropes are there. Uh, so I'm, of course, doing something in front of a consulate is a much bigger thing, but I'm totally delighted to have the opportunity to do it. Uh, doesn't, yeah, I'm proud of the country. I mean, I think it's a great, I think to have that opportunity, freedom, to, that, <clears throat> to be allowed to do that is in itself quite a thing. It doesn't mean I agree with everything. So, you know, I think that. It doesn't uh, make me part of any, it's not an official statement of, you know, complete I think that, you know, the idea of the freedom to, to, to do it, you know, it, it harkens back to some extent to um, President Kennedy talking about Frost and that the value was that he told it the way he saw it, that mm -hmm. he, he reflected us in that moment and our misgivings as well as our triumphs and just our, our, our very nature. And the idea of having the freedom to do uh, with a sculpture or a work of art in a public sense that is associated with the government by the nature of its proximity uh, speaks to that. Yeah, but I, but I also think that if you look at all the most interesting sculpture and painting, I mean, there's, there's always two sides on it. I mean, there's a, there's a piece that's affirmative, an affirmative aspect, and there's also critical aspects in the work. I mean, the work is really complicated. And I don't think, you know, <clears throat> put it like this, I don't think this work is propaganda. Like uh, Roman uh, art is propaganda. Compare if you look at Greek sculpture, Greek sculpture yeah. is divine. It's internal. So you look at Roman work, I mean it's propaganda. It's not that it's bad art, but it basically is propaganda. And I don't think any of the stuff at FAPE is propagandistic. I I, I think it's aspirational? The, oh, I don't you know, it's ambitious, but I don't think it's directive and I don't think it's sort of you know, well, I, 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 gotta, I gotta say, I think your work also is counterintuitive in the environments where we put it. For me, in, in the use of art, mm -hmm. or, or the, the opportunity of, of art in that context to communicate who we are as a society. And, and uh, I, I think it's a, a way to harmonize our governmental initiatives overseas. Uh, with an expression of who we are as a people, and I think that's a big part of what this does. I, I think that's essentially, the, uh, in, in many ways, Ambassador, the, the, the reason I, I very much wanted to have this discussion, because I think that you described a learning curve on that, and I think that's a learning curve that uh, the more it's understood and utilized, the, 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 the more powerful it can be. It feeds on itself. The water rises with every step in that direction. Uh, and, you know, looking back historically, we were talking earlier about things like the, the jazz dis diplomacy efforts, which were, you know, the CIA. Um, but nonetheless, the power of them was the freedom of them. It wasn't simply that they were great jazz musicians, that they spoke their mind when they were out there, and that served its purpose. Uh, it showed that we could do that. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, not understood quite enough. And I, I don't know if, uh, I think organizations like FAPE, I mean, like FAPE, there is only one FAPE. FAPE itself serves that purpose by taking the responsibility, essentially, to do that. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Well, our government today would be incapable of, I mean, we can't s spend money <laughs> rationally in any place, certainly not to do this. So certainly not today. <laughs> I mean, uh, so, not, so not this, not this week. That's so sure. we're 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 functionally we got to communicate things to outside the world, uh, in the rest of the world that may oh, well. be at risk here today. That's also, I mean, the, the other issue is once you get involved with government funding of the arts. I mean. I, I am, I'm very ambivalent. I mean, I think, of course, the government should fund the arts and it should stay hands off, but unfortunately, that's not what happens. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, you end up having politicians who object to something, and you end up getting... Isn't that a healthy discourse in some ways? I think, it's a, I think it's a healthy discourse, but I mean, you know, other countries like France spends 1% of the GNP on, mm -hmm. on art. And we spend, I don't know if anyone knows the number, but if I'm not mistaken, I was always told that the armed forces, no offense, I know there's a high right one, spends as much on like marching bands as the budget of the National Endowment. So I think, you know, I may, that may not be true. I'm not standing by that, but I think this is very, it's really. Music is culture. Music is, well, I think it is. I'm not, I'm all for marching I, bands. I'm very proud. I'm all for marching I'm bands. Be, I'm, be, I'm very proud of the forces. military marching bands. <laughs> and a little artwork. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the, but, the role of government in sponsoring art is, you know, one that obviously varies from system to system. I mean, if we're talking about France versus the United States, it's obviously a completely different, you know, public-private issue, though I think that this conversation points to the need government has to make use of the power that is implicit in our culture in general. Well, I, think they, I think they do, and I think that, you know, the fact is that one can say the, G, the French, G, it's 1 percent, but in France, you can't support cultural institutions and receive a tax advantage. Right, so that's in the, the United States. System. You can, and that is that's real support of cultural institutions. I mean, right. because to you know, FAPE is basically you know a non-for-profit organization. To my mind, it's not really about funding. Uh, in the end, it's about uh, actually living with that knowledge that culture is know, intersecting with all of these different areas. Uh, and that becomes a meaningful part of life, and it becomes reciprocal, whether it's diplomacy or education, uh, environment, health. There are all these intersections that somehow we don't see it, but I think in the experience that we've discussed today of uh, an embassy with our closest neighbor and biggest partner in so many ways, having that opportunity to capitalize on work that is going to go on, I mean, in perpetuity. This is there, and, you know, whether the... The, the, the pedestrian traffic changes, but the thing itself stays the same, uh, as a message is really important to hang on to. Uh, I'd like to open to questions now for the last 15 minutes. Uh, if you're at the table and you have uh, one of these microphones, you need to press the button to speak uh, and then turn it off when it's done so that others can speak in turn. Uh, and if you are in the outskirts, we have a microphone that can come around to you. Uh, so let's start now, uh, and I think I'm gonna actually call on somebody in a cold call sort of way. And I'm going to call my friend Phil Kennicott from the Washington Post. And Phil, you know, listening to this conversation uh, and, you know, living in Washington, surrounded by uh, the, two, the, the architecture of government, what is your impression of, of this conversation as it relates to, to, to sculpture and Joel's work in particular? You know, the first thing I have is a question. Uh, Please, that's and, and impreferable, thanks. Maybe we can leave it to the end after I say a few things, but uh, I'd be curious about Joel's response to the public architecture on view in Washington. Uh, you almost started talking about that, and then... The, then the public art in Washington? Public art in Washington. You, you drew back for a moment, but are there works that you think work really well in Washington by the standards you bring to your yeah, own Yeah, I art? do. I mean, the Washington Monument. That's a little old. Doesn't matter. The Lincoln Memorial, I think, is great. Something 20th century. Yeah, I think I think Maya Lin's Vietnam War Memorial is great. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually like my piece at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, it's become a kind of landmark too. I know. I went to took my grandchildren. You know, these people were on a marathon. And apparently, it was a marathon destination. That was interesting. Uh, what else have I seen more recent? Tell me, I, you know, I'm puzzled by the, the, the Air Force, those kind of contrails. It's kind of interesting. Not in my, I don't know what it's like up f close. Uh, I think the public, I think Washington's pretty tough to mm -hmm. get stuff out in the world. I mean, you have to go through federal fine arts, at least when I did it. Uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty tough audience. You, you spoke quite eloquently about your belief in the terms of the transparency of a work in front of a building, and I was wondering about what you think of the Henry Moore in front of the National Gallery, which is anything but a transparent well, work. Well, I mean, I think, 
Oh, I think some of the public sculpture of the National Gallery seems over almost, I mean, it doesn't have enough setback, so it's too close to the facade, but I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it's an interesting sculpture, but I don't, you know, I did this piece in Denver, it was a public work, and I can't tell you how I had to fight the architects to, they wanted to show, it was, it was the new Clifford Still Museum, uh, what's the name of the firm? Uh, Brad Culpful, right, Allied Works. And they wanted me to shove it under the Liebskin overhang, is which exactly what they did with the Oldenburg and kill it. And I really had to fight, fight, fight to pull it out into ambient space, which was the intent of the piece was to unify the whole South Denver campus. And it looks great, but I mean, you have to fight for it. A, a lot of architects are really resistant they're competitive with sculptors, and they're really resistant and think that the sculpture becomes an intrusion on their design. And I don't think that was the case, you know, with <clears throat> Jim Freed, who did the Holocaust Museum. And I don't think it was, it definitely is not the case with SOM, but some of these people really, you know, they want to, I mean, I am, I worked on some project, I am one to propose his own sculpture. And he's great. He's a, I am a great a great architect. Fortunately, I'm friendly with Sandy. You know, so he's <laughs> but I haven't seen. You know, like I have not seen the Korean War Memorial. I'm embarrassed to say. And uh, I think, you know, sculpture has this plays this role of information and mediation of parks and green spaces and architecture. It's a refrain. It's something to look at. I think it's totally critical mm -hmm. in the city. New York has very little. I mean, there's very little available space. But Washington is much more. And it's a more engaging public environment because of it. I would only say one thing, and that is you were probing a little bit about the communicative value of abstraction. And I would be 100% behind that personally. But if you look around Washington, the sculptures that foreign governments have had a hand in placing here, um, and you were to ask people which ones they like, I would bet that far and away, people would respond mostly to the realistic sculptures. An example would be the, the sculpture Canadian of Gandhi um, on Massachusetts Avenue. People love that. And it allows them to connect with an aspect of Indian history that they can hold on to and talk about. So I think that the power of abstraction needs a stronger um, defense to understand how and in what ways it can compete with these other sculptures that really do allow people to kind of directly access an that aspect. That are about of commemoration, right? right? Well, I mean, that's it. That it's definitely, listen, I mean, some of the worst, I mean, I've, you know, disappointingly exhibited work and then a hundred yards away, there was some something that I considered dismal and uninteresting, and it was like all the school kids would stand around it because it was representational. I mean, it's a question of what standards you want to hold and what you think is possible. I, a lot of abstract work can be dry and disappointing. A lot of representational work can be equally dry and disappointing. Nevertheless, you know, it has the kind of narrative hook. But I don't think it's a question of abstraction or representation. I think it's a question of the quality of the actual work. So something that is abstract and engaging, I think. I think it's also perhaps a question of, you know, if you think about uh, as one as an individual is either taken to see something or it's something that's on a tour, let's say, uh, thinking of DC particularly, uh, the, the implicitness of, I'm going to learn something here, there is something here that's to know, uh, is certainly uh, heightened by the literal. You say, here is a person. This is a representation of a person, and this person is here because they did this. Uh, which, to me, speaks to the value of, you know, who's giving the education and giving the tour, which, you know, there can be the whole higher level of education is about this is here not simply because it commemorates history, but it has something that we have to learn for ourselves that we are going to be able to take away, not in a rote way, but in a creative way. Uh, so I think that speaks to something about 
uh, how we how we educate and how we what kind how we of bring people. Occurs. Yeah, and, and what, what's there? Well, I, the the uh, consulate in Guangzhou did a massive effort of outreach, and I think it was really effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's have another question. Uh, if you can say who you are, Shane. <laughs> So um, thanks, Jamie. I'm Shane Christensen. I've been a Foreign Service officer since 2000, served um, mostly overseas, and I'm taking a year of leave to work on civil discourse in the country. And I've heard um, a couple words referred to our panelists, both special and great. And I'd just like to add extraordinary um, in speaking about Damien, because he's done absolutely incredible things since we were at the Kennedy School together um, years ago. And I'm so pleased to see you as the director of the, of the Aspen Institute's um, arts program. So maybe a couple of things. One, at a very mundane kind of personal level, uh, thank God for art and sculpture in our U.S. government buildings. Um, and uh, if anybody has been in some of the U.S. government buildings, um, I mean, I really hear you when you say this is a chance to bring some liveliness and some vitality um, and a common space. And I think those of us who have served as diplomats or you know, U.S. government workers, um, you, know, you make our quality of life uh, uh, better. So. Um, but, but beyond that, this is an, art is, is incredibly important to U.S. soft power. And I think that we need to continue to do even more to advance um, not just U.S. soft power at a moment like where we are today, um, but, but art's ability to help um, push it forward. Um, we use art all the time in diplomatic interactions for icebreakers, to push forward conversations. And I think most importantly, maybe the one thing we haven't talked about is that in what can often be awkward moments between um, a U.S. diplomat and a foreign interlocutor, I'm thinking of uh, maybe a, uh, a U.S. ambassador to the OECD in Paris, where I last served, speaking with a, with a Russian interlocutor at a tense moment in U.S.-Russian relations. Um, the fact of having art, beautiful paintings in the ambassador's residence serves uh, as a way to get away from what was otherwise a very awkward moment of, you know, talking about the kind of Cheetos that they were sharing or whatever, and actually turn to a conversation that could connect them based not on policy differences but a sense of shared humanity. That's and that's ultimately what, um, what I think art uh, can do so often for us in our diplomatic interactions. So, um, so thank you for that. And maybe just a final thing, which is, you know, I think at a time of of such polarization here at home and, and increased incivility. Um, and while I think a lot of foreign audiences kind of scratch their head about what's happening here at home in America, something that I think, you know, Damien, you've said and others, which is um, art is a real opportunity to show a different face of America and, you know, the creativity um, of our culture, the free sensibility um, that I think you mentioned. So, um, so thank God for your work, and, and thanks for this discussion. Thank you. Alma? I agree, <clears throat> I agree with everything that you just said, having been at an embassy myself with my husband. Uh, what I don't believe was pointed out today, and I hope that, that most of you understand, is the uniqueness of FAPE in the cultural landscape. It's the, I would consider it the most perfect public and private partnership that we have going for the arts uh, in America. Um, the FAPE works directly in a very collegial manner with the Department of State. And it's not easy to navigate, as you all know. Uh, but they've done that for many, many years. And in their quest, to represent the best of America, they have had the freedom to select our most outstanding sculptors and artists for site-specific works. It's not the same as in the ambassador's residence where I got a chance, as you know, to pick out whatever I liked. Uh, the Massachusetts Avenue, and I agree with you, uh, Mr. Shapiro, that good representational art is lovely good abstract work is lovely. Uh, up and down, Mass uh, poor is poor. But up and down Massachusetts Avenue, we have Winston Churchill waving at us. Nelson Mandela, who has just been put in front of the embassy of South Africa, is too close to the street. You have the Queen 
of uh, Norway. She's at the next corner, and on it, on it goes. But what's so wonderful about your work is that it makes people think. It makes them, it, it, it creates some type of uh, feeling within them, some emotional feeling that they have to create for themselves. The representational is wonderful and the good is especially nice. But the work that you have done has made everyone think and appreciate the magnificence and the freedom of crea creativity that is America. And thank we thank you for that. Thank you. I, I would echo that and I would also say that, um, echo again about the, the role of FAPE in this is unique. Uh, and it is, I mean, if, we, if only we just concentrate as we have today on the work that, that uh, Joel Shapiro has done, we can see the absolutely unique value of injecting that kind of invention into the public sphere, uh, whether, you know, whether overseas or, or, or here uh, in Washington, D.C., in the United States. Uh, it is, in fact, exactly a, a, about that. It is not a, a you must learn this. It is who we are as humans and what it makes us think and the potential and the possibility. I keep coming back to that. When I, th when I look at the, uh, the work, I think about possibility. Um, do you, I, I want to ask you just one more question. We should have one more from, from the audience before we adjourn. When you think about possibility yourself, you said uh, some, in some ways it's easier to have, you know, the, the kind of restrictions, the wrong word, but the dialogue with another entity, whether it's an embassy, a consulate, you know, about and how it goes, you know, how it's going to fit, how it's going to go. Well, I mean, I, you know, I mean, artists, it's not one fluid frenzy in the studio. <laughs> it's pretty, I mean, <laughs> you know, you work and you realize something and you kind of, I don't, I mean, you don't, that is the analysis yeah. doesn't happen first. The analysis is after the fact. So I think to have, you know, another opportunity to work can, in a specific context, rather than creating the form for your own mm. realization, can really bring out greater possibility. I, you know, you, you, you actually just Im seized on something that I think is essentially in this message is what Howard Gardner calls the artistic habits of mind that this projects uh, in terms of a, it does not just come, you go in the studio and it just happens. There's a readdressing and a reassessing and a readdressing oh. and a re reforming and rephrasing and it, it's a constant and that is uh, the artistic habit of mind, essentially, is yeah, how one does total that. total lack of, you know, lack, I mean, it's not that you lack an idea, a lack of something new. I mean, it is a heightened moment when you make a form and put it together. It's, it's not, I'm not saying it's otherworldly, but it is the sort of moment of real ecstasy. And, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, <clears throat> Sometimes you just can't do that, but you, you can indeed have some projects you get involved in, and that, that actually happens. I'd love to end on that note. Simply the image of the, the visa line and the thinking about artistic habits of mind, the potential for creative ecstasy, uh, both in the line and also in the embassy and in the consulate, looking at it. Uh, so, Joel, I want to say, first of all, just incredible to be in the presence of your work and you describing it. It's, th it's a privilege to be. Uh, in the presence of, of an artist describing their work, and it's just been uh, an honor having you here at the Aspen Institute. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, Ambassador Giffen, the context you gave us uh, for the, the, the work's uh, placement at the embassy really framed it in terms of uh, where the government uh, intersects in this, in this case. Uh, and I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at future roundtables. Uh, and the last word, uh, Joel, do you think uh, there is ecstasy to be had uh, artistically and creatively from the, from the ambassador's residence when they look out at the work in Ottawa? Ah. Is it an inspiration? <laughs> you can't see it from there. You can't. <laughs> the ambassador. <laughs> he has <his> <laughs> You know, that is exactly what, you know, I hadn't